We could not be more thrilled that um, stepping in graciously as our guest speaker is Canadian diplomat, federal minister, foreign policy analyst, democracy activist, and author, the Honorable Chris Alexander. <laughs> Ambassador Chris Alexander was born in Toronto, where he attended Oriel Park Public and the University of Toronto School. He earned a BA in history and political science from McGill University in Montreal and an MA in philosophy and economics at Balliol College, Oxford. He also studied for a term at the University Laval in Quebec. For 18 years, he served as a diplomat in various capacities. He joined the Canadian Foreign Service in 1991, serving twice at the Canadian Embassy in Moscow, including as Deputy Head of Mission. He went on to serve as Canada's first resident ambassador to Afghanistan between 2003 and 2005, and Deputy Special Representative of the United Nations Secretary General for Afghanistan. Ambassador Alexander is the author of several books, including The Long Way Back, Afghanistan's Quest for Peace, published by HarperCollins in 2011, and more recently, Ending Pakistan's Proxy War in Afghanistan, published by the McDonald Laurier Institute in 2021. Chris Alexander was the Member of Parliament for Ajax Pickering and Parliamentary Secretary for National Defense and Canada's Minister of Citizenship and Immigration, where he introduced express entry and committed to bringing the first 10,000 Syrian refugees to Canada. In 2016-2017, Chris Alexander was candidate for the leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada to promote innovative policies for a new Canada, which included strong advocacy for a tougher approach to Russia for its 2014 invasion of Ukraine. He is now an executive of Hacklip & Company, a global strategic advisory firm, a board member of the TSX-listed United Corporations, a distinguished fellow with the Canadian International Council and the McDonnell Laurier Institute. He is also the co-founder of Powered by People, a wholesale marketplace for makers worldwide. When he isn't commenting on international affairs stories on CTV News, Ambassador Alexander's opinion pieces on the threats posed by China, Russia, and the disinformation wars waged by authoritarian states appear frequently in national publications, including the National Post and the Globe and Mail. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Canadian diplomat, minister, author, and democracy activist, the Honorable Chris Alexander. Mighty round of applause, please. One of many that we've had tonight to honor all of you, the tiny platoons, as I was saying to Diane Francis, who keep civil society strong in support of Ukraine, in support of democracy, in support of this great nation of Canada. All of those who contributed to the Peterson Literary Fund and above all those of us who brought us together here tonight and convened us and created this institution, the Shimko family, my long-standing friends, thank you to all of you. Let's give them a huge round of applause. The Ukrainian community, as you all know, is one that has no single head, uh, not in Canada and anywhere else, and that is its strength. But it is fantastic to see so many leaders in this room tonight who are connected to leaders across Canada, across North America, around the world, and above all, back home in Kiev, back home on the front that is never absent from our thoughts for more than a few seconds. That's really why we're here tonight. And that's really why I'm proud to be your stand-in speaker 
uh, filling the big shoes of someone who stood in Kiev twice uh, at important moments in Ukrainian history and US-Ukrainian relations. Ambassador Taylor, I spoke to him on the telephone just last year. Uh, I think on the same days that I was speaking to my great friend and your great friend, Roman Vashuk, about how to bring more Afghan refugees who had worked for Canada and worked for NATO and worked for the United States to safety. And when our borders were, let's be honest, not as open as they should have been, and US bureaucracy was at its worst and confused, Ukraine opened its doors. And Ukrainian policymakers and leaders were willing to have that conversation because they recognized need, humanitarian urgency when they saw it. And Ambassador Taylor was at the absolute center of those discussions along with many others from this community. But let's recall the larger context. Last year's disaster in Afghanistan, which really robbed me of sleep and still makes me despair about the ability of even strong democracies to be principled in this day and age, it was one of the enabling conditions for Putin's, for Russia's large-scale invasion this year. It showed weakness. And it built on the weakness that we had all shown by doing nothing to address the plight of Syrian refugees. And Syrians made homeless in their own countries, victims of a civil war imposed on them by their regime with the help of Putin's fascists and Iran's theocrats. And that weakness helped to set the stage for the first invasion of Ukraine in 2014, which led to an inadequate response. Some sanctions, yes, championed by Canada, some actions. Ted and I were proud to be part of a government that was the first NATO country to start training the Ukrainian army on Ukrainian territory in NATO command and control, in NATO military methods that were then scaled up and emulated by the United States and the UK, which started their training programs later and helped to give Ukraine some of the backbone of excellence that is ultimately made in Ukraine and has grown thanks to Ukrainian leadership and thanks to Ukrainian determination. But there's a deeper story that we have to acknowledge at this first dinner of your fund and foundation since February 24th. A deeper story of Russian impunity and Western appeasement that has gone unaddressed for much longer than just these last years or this last decade or even the time under Putin. The Budapest Memorandum, ignored, discarded, never backed up with anything close to the determination that would have made those obligations, would have allowed those obligations to hold. The Bucharest Summit of NATO, in 2008, when a black and white commitment was made to launch Ukraine on a path to accession, to an alliance for self-defense that would have prevented these invasions, discarded again. We now know, thanks to mostly German and French lobbying, but acquiesced in by the United States of America, by Canada, by all allies who thought, yes, it's a noble ideal, it's a noble goal, but not yet. And then the deeper story of appeasement and impunity that runs through the whole Cold War and back to 1945 when a totalitarian regime 
under Stalin, was considered an ally by our democratic countries and given a permanent seat at the United Nations, and basically a license and a warrant to reoccupy half of Europe and enslave millions of people. A fact that continued for decades, for generations, affecting almost all of the families in this room. The enclaves after 1991, Moldova, Georgia, Russia's twisted role in the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict, unaddressed, no confrontation, no attempt to make international law hit home, hold for this particular permanent member of the Security Council. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, forgotten in 1941 when the Soviet Union suddenly became our ally. Versailles, the Soviet Union, Russia, after its revolution, absent, isolated, ignored, neglected, not brought into the arrangements that were supposed to govern Europe and much of the world after the First World War. And as a consequence, the reoccupation of Belarus, the killing of Belarusian, Ukrainian intelligentsia, leaders, writers, translators, national icons ignored by the world. We have spent a century forgetting to make Russia and the Soviet Union subject to the same rules that we are willingly subject to in today's international community. And Ukraine is fighting today to end that period of impunity, to make that imperialistic country subject to those rules, to make the world safer for all of us, by making Russia less of a menace to Europe and the whole world. Yeah. And that's why they deserve all our support. And that's why we are supporting, but not enough. And that's why we have to confront this specter, which still undermines our ability to support Ukraine, of disinformation, political corruption, and active measures that are still hamstringing our democracies, subverting our governments, undermining our political will, the will that most Canadian citizens and I believe most American citizens and Europeans now have to support Ukraine decisively. How does it work? It's asymmetric hybrid warfare. It's strategic subversion. It's the gray zone, those people who infuriate us when we see them on cable television or on YouTube, mouthing Kremlin talking points. It is those libertarian, self-regarding, greedy, blinkered oligarchs, whether they're in Ukraine or in Silicon Valley, who think that they are God and that they can impose a peace settlement on Ukraine and hand Crimea over to a fascist Kremlin. Elon Musk is not alone in this vanity, in this madness, and their influence is still too great. Brexit would not have happened without these shadow games, without these active measures. Trump would not have happened without this political warfare, this hybrid warfare. Canada's truckers blockade, which began in late 2021 and was timed to culminate in late February 2022, would not have happened without this hybrid warfare, this asymmetrical campaign, this interference by Moscow. It must stop. And we have to talk, call these things by their names. And we have to call out those in all of our democracies who are naive enough to make themselves tools of these very dangerous games. We are still not doing enough. Though the examples we should be following are obvious. 
listen to President Zelensky, as I know you all do, any day, several times a day. There is a menu there. There is a to-do list for every leader in every democracy, ju just in NATO, for any country that has the slightest respect for the UN Charter and for the principle of territorial integrity, of inviolability of borders, of self-defense, which predates the United Nations by centuries. This is a universal, eternal principle of national life. We should all be supporting Ukraine. We should all be endorsing Ukraine's war aims. We should all be doing what President Zelensky asks of us. And for Canada, that means, Ken and I, haven't even discussed these things tonight. It should mean sending more armored vehicles. We have lots of them. We make the best in the world. Why could we possibly not be sending hundreds of reconnaissance vehicles, vehicles for infantry, the latest, the best, some that are surplus to Canada's needs, some that are not? They would help, they would speed the victory we know that they are needed. Why are we not training Ukrainian forces again with the air defenses that are happening on Ukrainian territory? <laughs> Deploying Canadian troops as we had them deployed until late last year, our other allies would follow quite quickly. It's a timid approach we've been taking. And the failure to provide air assets, to provide air defenses early, was a tragic failure that has cost thousands of Ukrainian lives and slowed this victory. Leaders are waking up to it, but they need our voices. They need all of us, the tiny platoons, to stand in support of these simple, common sense measures that won world wars, that kept our democracies safe for de decades after 1945, and that are literally the only chance we have of having democracy as we all wish to have it for decades to come. The three A's, air power, armor, an armada in the Black Sea, protecting international shipping, helping the very creative Ukrainian forces that have made life miserable already for Russia's Black Sea fleet, put that fleet back in harbor, sink it as soon as possible, and restore democratic sh and international shipping in the Black Sea. <laughs> Training, attention to democracy that wants to be born again in Belarus, the fragility of Moldova. When Ukraine is victorious, there will be other victories, and there will be other countries that have needs to transform their institutions, to give new life to their civil society, to rejoin European institutions. We have to start thinking about this right now, and we have to be tightening sanctions and multiplying expulsions. Why are these terrifying, nihilistic agents of violence representing the GRU, the FSB, and the SVR still sitting in Ottawa and in Toronto in Canadian missions? Get them out of here and send the gray zone illegal networks that they support, that they water and nurture, send them packing as well. It will be a very different Canada. It will be a much stronger cause of democracy that we have around the world. Yes, fascist Russia will still remain, but it will have formidable forces arrayed around it. It will be in new, reduced borders, and democracy itself, the cause that underpins all of our hopes, that will give a new impulse to prosperity in our world for decades to come, will be stronger thanks to Ukraine's sacrifice, if only we are prepared to stand on the principle of supporting that self-defense, supporting the basic principles 
from which we have benefited for centuries. Thank you very much for the chance to be with you tonight.